Yes, Judge, thank you. The pre-trial reviews in the matter of CFI 025 2020 before Justice Lord Angus Gillani and is being held by way of video conference. Any orders or directions made after or during the course of this hearing will be issued by the registry in Dubai on the judge's instructions. The claimant is represented by Kochar and Co legal consultants. Lead counsel is Alexander Buran. The fourth defendant is a litigantin person uh, represented by Mr. Vijay Kapoor. The second and fifth defendants are represented by Bistwind Law Corporation for Legal Consultancy. Lead counsel is Shaheen PV. However, Mr. Shaheen is not in attendance now, so Mr. Shayan will attend on behalf of him. The six to eight defendants are represented by KBH Limited. Lead counsel is Tina, uh, Tina Asgiri. Yes, thank you very much. Right, um, Mr. Burrell, is it? Um, you appear for the claimant, is that right? Uh, yes, you're an RD. What, what do you, how, are we going to, how are we going to do this? Are, you going to get, are we going to go in turn through each party or take it topic by topic? I, I suspect it might be easier. I, I, of course, at your discretion, Your Honour, but I think it might be easier if we take it topic by topic. As I see it, I think there are four different items on the agenda for today having regard to what's been filed by uh, D6 to D8 on Friday. Uh, one is the trial timetable. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other is um, it's a sort of a wider uh, item, which is administrative issues. And so within that, we've got the uh, purported draft protocol and the various other administrative issues that go towards the hearing, such as transcription and uh, the bundle. Uh, the third item is the agreed, well, the, the uh, amendments to the case memorandum and the list of issues, including, I think, the fourth defendant submitted further amendments today. And the fourth item are the additional requested directions from D6 to D8, uh, one concerning uh, D4's expert report and the other relating to this conflict of interest issue. So those are the four four items. Um, I, I'm not sure if you'd like to proceed with it uh, item by item um, so that each each party is able to put forward their representations in relation to each. Yes, shall we just, um, should we start with ones with which the second and fifth defendants are not principally concerned at the moment since Mr. Sheehan is not here? That, that's, that's, that's a good idea, yes, Your Honour. Um, in that case, I suspect the uh, a D6 to D8 requested directions as these concern uh, either just the claimant or, or uh, D4, as I understand it. Um, I, I think that there might be issues of relevance to D5, but primarily they, they concern D5 less than the remaining issues. Yes, well, should we start with those? Um... Should I hear then first from counsel for the six to eight defendants? Um, yes. Ms. Ms. Asparian, I think these are your applications. Oh. <clears throat> You're muted. Still muted. Apologies, I'm having some technical issues. I'm. Are you able to hear me? I, no, I, I keep can, jumping onto I, mute. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Hopefully that will that will hold. If not, we'll try another another laptop to see if I can get a better connection. Um, I'm grateful to my learned friend for introducing the the issues to be determined at the PT at the PTR and um, starting with those ones which will impact um, D5 the least. Um, as my learned friend has noted, those are the issues of the fourth defendant's expert report and also the conflict of um, interest issue. Perhaps, Your Honour, if I may, I'll start with the um, expert report of D4. Yeah. Um, may I just inquire, Your Honour, have you had an opportunity to review my skeleton, my brief skeleton argument? Uh, yes, briefly. Uh, yes. You your material this morning. I'm I'm grateful. There's um, perhaps if I could ask your honour to turn to 
paragraph 13, which runs from page three onto page four of that um, skeleton argument, which sets out the directions that we are that we are seeking. And perhaps if I could ask your honour just to have that in mind as I run through um, what, as I run through the issues. What, what paragraph? <clears throat> paragraph 13. Yeah. And specifically on page um, page four at points 13 A, B, C and D, and there is set out the directions that we are seeking. Um, Your Honour, as you may recall, on the 27th of January um, of this year, directions were given um, permitting the fourth defendant, well, both the fifth defendant and the fourth defendant to file um, expert reports in these proceedings. In accordance with the directions that were given, um, and a copy of which is at page 8H9 of the PTR bundle, the parties were to file expert reports complying with the requirements of RDC rules 31.55 and 31.56. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> On the 15th of February 2022, um, the fourth defendant filed his, his expert report. Upon reviewing that report, three primary issues were identified. The first was that there wasn't a proper statement of truth. The second, that there were no instructions appended to the report. And the third was that a number of documents referred to in the report um, were missing. D6 to D8 wrote to the, wrote to the defendant, uh, the fourth defendant, to request that these matters be rectified. To a certain extent, the issue concerning the statement of truth has been rectified. Um, and if it assists the court at G3 of the PTR bundle, there is a statement of truth that was filed on the 14th of the 14th of March 2022. However, the other two items which have been identified by D6 to D8, namely the lack of instructions and the lack of supporting documents, um, have yet to be rectified. This is a particular issue to D, D4 to D6, A, because it will hinder preparation for cross-examination at trial, but B, because both experts, that is to say D5 and D4's experts, have identified what appears to be a very serious allegation relating to invoices that were provided to the claimant, uh, the claimant bank in relation to monies that were drawn down from the facility. Those sums form part and parcel of the total amount um, that is in dispute in these proceedings and that is being claimed by the, by the claimant. And what appears to be said by D4 and D6 is, uh, sorry, D4 and D5, is that um, false invoices effectively were being um, provided to the claimant. Monies were then being drawn down against those invoices. Um, and the money was going into the pocket of either D4 or D5. They both blame each other in this regard. In those circumstances, um, it is important to understand the instructions that were provided to D4's expert, because a number of opinions have been expressed in his, in his report, the basis of which remains unclear. Equally, a number of documents are referred to in D4's report, which have not been provided either by the fourth defendant during the course of standard or specific production, or by exhibiting those documents to the expert report. And if it assists the court um, in this regard, if I could perhaps take your honour to page D713 of the PTR bundle. Um, you're on it, you're on mute. Which, which page? D713. Maybe, No, uh, I've got a, I've got D, which is the second statement of 
D713, yes. The exhibit PKG4. Yes, Your Honour. It's a copy of um, the fourth defendant's expert report, which we have which we have highlighted just to assist in demonstrating some of the issues that are faced um, in understanding the opinions that have been reached by D4's expert. Yeah. yeah. And as Your Honour will note, on that very first page of D713, um, I've highlighted the emails that have been reviewed in the process of preparing this report, copies of which have not been provided. Yeah. Yeah. On the next page, D714, towards the bottom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, again highlighted, there are references to emails dated the 10th of October 2016, the 13th of February 2017, which have not been provided. On the following page, D715, there is um, a summary of what appears in those emails, but the actual emails have not been provided. Uh, unless Your Honour wishes me to do so, I won't take you through every single highlighted section, other than to, to note that each of those sections that have been highlighted refer to opinions which have been reached on the basis of evidence or instructions which have not been made known to the, um, to the, to the parties, to all of the parties, not just D6 to D8. When a request was made for a copy of the instructions, um, the response that was received was that these would only be provided if D6 to D8 provided a copy of their instructions to, to their expert. Um, D6 to D8 have not instructed, nor do they have permission to file an expert um, report in these proceedings. But nonetheless, it is submitted that regardless of whether that was the case, the instructions um, are not subject to privilege and ought to be produced if the parties so request, particularly in circumstances where the purpose is to understand whether or not the provisions of RDC part 31 have been met and specifically paragraph 3b of your honours order of the 27th of January 2022 which required compliance with RDC rule 31.55. In those circumstances um, your honour the request that is made for directions at this PTR are those set out at paragraph 13 of my skeleton argument, namely that within seven days of um, the date of the PTR, the fourth defendant provides a copy of the expert reports and all documents referred to in his expert report. Um, I have requested permission to apply, if so necessary, um, to strike out those parts of the report which are not in compliance with the provisions of RDC part 31 in the event that upon reviewing the instructions that becomes the case. Um, and I have asked for what the court may feel as a somewhat draconian fourth order, namely that in the event that, that um, the instructions and the documents are not provided, the fourth defendant <coughs> is not entitled to rely on, on the expert report as filed. That, that would be a bit premature. Uh, because the, the, for two reasons for timing, we're, we're talking about in June, End of May, June. May, June. Yes, the 30th of May. And, and secondly, we're talking about, talking about compliance, which may be arguable, arguable, arguable somewhere. somewhere. So I think the better thing, so I if, I was, if I was in a general liberty, I am on the seat of the pursue. Then you can take it from there. So on that basis, unless you, want to, basis, unless you want to persuade me further than that, I'll further hear what I'll is Mr. Kemp. Um, Your Honour, unfortunately I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty again. Perhaps Mr. Kapoor could um, make his submissions and I will try to log on through another computer in the meantime to see if, if I can resolve the issues. It's probably useful if you hear what he has to say. I will leave this computer on whilst I'll try to get another one um, joining the the uh, the conference. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Kapoor. Mr. Kapoor. Are you there? Are you there? Mr. Kapoor. 
just a second, Your Honor. Uh, just, 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 just give me a few seconds, please. Uh, yes, that, I'm back. Uh, can can you can everybody hear me clearly? Are you Mr. Kapoor? That's right. Yes, thank you. I can hear you. Yes. All right. Did you hear? Did you hear the decisions made on this point by counsel for the uh, six to eight defendants? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I I think as far as uh, you know, the scope and instructions and other things which were provided to the expert is concerned. Uh, uh, and the documents which she is referring to, uh, when we had earlier had this, uh, you know, part 14 uh, uh, hearing where we were uh, contesting the summary judgment, uh, I had provided the, you know, the communication which I had with the, my lawyers at that point of time, and uh, those are already on record. So I was actually a little surprised that, uh, you know, being asked for those communications. As well as the expert is concerned, uh, there were several emails and several things which we we had given to him because when he went through a rigorous process of questioning us, we had provided uh, as many copies or anything which we had given to him. So I am actually not sure why some of those have not found a, a copy or a mention in the report itself or as a lecture, but I'm happy to look into that and uh, you know provide the copies to uh, the council for six to eight in case that's what is uh, relevant. Yes, the have you got um, count the other side's uh, skeleton argument? We're looking at paragraph 13 A and B. Have uh, you got that? Yeah, well, let me just open it. Please. Of course. 13. 13 A and B. All right. I, yeah, I have no no objection in providing those documents. I can send it across within the next uh, seven to eight days. I will uh, contact the expert, check with him exactly where the the references are, and I don't mind providing those. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an order that you do it within seven days. Can you do that? Yeah, that should be fine. And I think you should send it not only to the six to eight defendants, but to the other defendants as well, yeah. and and to the claim. No to more. all other, all other parties, all right. right? Sure. Um, and what I what I propose to do is make an order in terms of thirteen A and B, but not make an order in terms of C and D. C is the the sanction if you get if you don't do it. And I'll simply leave it. Put, uh, add a provision saying liberty to all parties to apply. In the event of non-compliance, do you so, understand what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Now I haven't asked other parties whether they have anything to say about this, but I can't imagine they do. Do, do either the first? Does, does the claimant have anything to say about this? Uh, no, no, no submissions on this issue, Your Honour. What about um, the second and fifth defendants? Uh, we also had the similar prayers as, uh, as D6 to D8, and I think your Lordship's uh, order would suffice in that aspect. Thank you very much. The, therefore, I'll make the order in 13. Uh, I'm saying this for your benefit, Maita. Uh, th I make the order in 13 A and B, and at C, I would simply say liberty to all parties to apply in the event of alleged non compliance with this order. All right. Now, what's the next? Um, there's the conflict of interest point now. Uh, who, this is also raised by uh, by by the sixth to eighth defendants. 
So you, you've come back. Your Honour, um, yes, hopefully you can you can hear me um, through this device. Did you hear did you hear how we disposed of that last one? Are you happy with that? Yes, Your Honour. Yeah. And now you want to talk about conflict of interest. Um yes. Your Honour, um at the outset I'd like to say that really the aim of, of drawing this and bringing this to the court's attention at the PTR <laughs> is largely to get to the bottom of, of what appears to be a bit of a recurring theme in these proceedings and to the extent possible d6 to d8 would like to draw um to draw a line under this um now which is why we have um raised the specific direction that i that i have referred to in my skeleton argument which i'll come to in a moment <clears throat> I appreciate that the issue was first raised by the fourth defendant in December 2020 in the course of his application to set aside default judgment. But as far as I'm aware, having looked at the judgment that was handed down by His Excellency Justice Alm Harry, there uh, the issue was not decided in those proceedings, so there is no res judicata, as it were, in relation to this particular issue. Now, um. From day one of the, these proceedings, it has always been D6 to D8's case um, that, and part of their defence, that um, that they ought to have been released from their personal guarantees, which were provided, um, and therefore this impacts upon and has um, an effect upon the liability which the bank is seeking to oppose, uh, impose on on the sixth to eighth defendants. On the 15th of February, when we received D4's expert report, um, the last annexure to that report was an email sent by D7 to D4. And that email appears at page G38 of the PTR bundle. Yep. That email um, is an email from um, the seventh defendant to the fourth defendant, setting out the seventh defendant's understanding of legal advice which had been obtained by the fourth defendant relating to the discharge of the personal and the corporate guarantees. And that advice was obtained by the law firm representing the bank in these proceedings. That email was then, um, as we understand it, sent from the fourth defendant to the claimant's lawyers. We do not know precisely what advice was provided to D4 in this regard, other than the, the note of, of what was relayed by Mr. Kapoor to um, Mr. Gupta. But we do know that um, unless Mr. Kapoor states otherwise um, during the course of today's PTR, that he did not demure from or in any way object to the contents of this email. And furthermore, we know which that this. Which particular part of the email should I be focusing on? Um, underneath quote, yeah. your Honor, you'll see we have recently received a facility letter. Yeah. And that whole paragraph there then sets out um, steps that needed to be taken in order to register the sale of um, the shares in the first defendant. And right at the bottom of that paragraph, you'll see in brackets a reference to Kucha and, um, and company who have suggested. And then each of the bullet points underneath that first paragraph um, set out the advice that was received. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the final the final element of that advice being that there would be a new facility letter which would be signed by the shareholder slash Mr Kapoor and based on this UBI will allow the utilization of existing facilities and release the personal and corporate guarantees given to them earlier again on this assumption. Yeah. We don't quite know what advice took place but um, Mr Kapoor doesn't appear to be disputing the contents of this um, email as being a correct recollection of the conversation that he had with the claimant's lawyers. 
We also know that the claimants' lawyers did receive this email, and, and your lordship, can, um, your honour, you can see it towards the bottom of the email. Um, this appears to have been forwarded on to um, Mrs. Khan uh, at 9:31 a.m. on the 30th of July, 2019. Yeah. Now, when the conflict of interest issue was first um, raised back in December 2020, this email was not in play. It wasn't provided by D4, um, D7 or the claimant's lawyers. Mr Gupta has yeah. filed a witness statement um, setting out the reasons why um, this wasn't produced at the time. And, and if it assists, um, Your Honour, that can be found at pages D694, to D696 of the PTR bundle. Yeah. And in that, in his sixth witness statement, Mr Gupta um, notes that when he had done an initial search for emails um, relating to this matter, this email hadn't come up. When he tried to run another search against the, the various search terms um, he had previously put in, again, this email didn't come up. And it was only when he specifically went into his sent items and looked for the email that he was able to find it. And that's the reason he hadn't referred to it before. But what he does confirm in his witness statement, um, specifically at paragraphs 20 onwards, which was at page D695, yeah. is that this email records <laughs> his understanding and his recollection of the advice which um, Mr Kapoor had received from the claimant's lawyers in 2019 about the release of the guarantee. The claimant's yeah. response to, to um, the issue of conflict, um, once we noted the contents of this particular email, is first that they only advised the fourth defendant about the Dubai court proceedings, and secondly, they did not act for the fourth defendant in these proceedings. Your Honour, we say the position is not as, as binary as stated by the, um, as state by the, the claimant's lawyers. The, the real issue here is whether confidential information was imparted to the claimant. And if confidential information was imparted, which relates to the subject matter of these proceedings, whether that has knowingly or unknowingly been used to the advantage of the claimant in these proceedings. Because the sixth to eighth defendants were not um, in direct communication with the claimant's lawyers, we do not know precisely what discussions took place or what advice was, was provided. And to a certain extent, it's not clear to us whether and to what extent any of this impacts upon the, the current proceedings. It may be that they don't, or it may be that they do. But what we require and what we are requesting from, um, what we have requested from the claimant's lawyers is an account of the nature of the advice that was provided, copies of any um, advice that was provided in relation specifically to the guarantee issue. Um, although as it transpires, um, the issues relating to uh, the issues between the fourth and the fifth defendant, which the claimant's lawyers were advising on that was taking place in the Dubai court, have now made their way into these proceedings and are potentially material to the, to the dispute between the parties. Um, um, and we also... can, you, can you just help me? Yes. Um, it's, probably, it's probably my fault, but I haven't lived with this case in the same way as you all have. Um, the confidential information which may, on one view, um, have been communicated to the claimant's lawyers is, who's, is, is confidential information coming from the fourth or fifth defendant, is that right? The fourth defendant, that's correct. Fourth defendant. Um, well, I can see that the fourth defendant might have an objection. But why, why, does this, why does it give the sixth to eighth defendant any objection? We are not, we understand the fourth defendant, and, and Mr. Kapoor perhaps can, can, can answer this, has raised this in the issue of, uh, specifically within the issue of there being a conflict of interest. Um, we're not sure to what extent he has any any objection to this uh, the, to the direction that is being sought, and I don't know perhaps if this would be a convenient point for me to stop and let Mr. Kapoor answer. Not, not quite yet, yeah. um, because I, I still not. If you're if you're making a, a, a seeking an order about it, it's out of thought. It would be because your confident your your confidential information has somehow crossed the line through through the medium of a lawyer. But um, what confidential information is there of yours that we're concerned about? 
In relation to, to us and putting um, to one side anything to do with the fourth and the fifth defendants, it's in relation to the release of the guarantees. Now, um, Mr. We, uh, it was Mr. Gupta, the seventh defendant's understanding that Mr. Kapoor was liaising with the claimant's lawyers about the release of the guarantee, how to affect that, how to liaise with the bank, EBI, in terms, in terms of affecting this, this release, and that effectively Mr. Kapoor was doing this on behalf of all of the defendants. Therefore, although there was not a direct relationship, indirectly, there was confidential information being passed. OK, where, is, where, where do you set out the order that you seek? Um, the order is more in the form of a broad direction, a paragraph, um, paragraph 23 of my skeleton argument, which is a direction requiring the claimant's legal representative to file a witness statement setting out the advice provided by D4, sorry, provided to D4 concerning, I've put here his dispute with D5, as well as the release of the guarantees and exhibiting to that statement copies of file notes, attendance notes and correspondence relating to the same. In light of your honours comments, I, I appreciate that perhaps the reference to D5 um, might be a step too far, but I would ask for the rest of the directions to be ordered at today's PTR. And what about the last sentence? Um, that was there to protect Mr. Kapoor because I understood he was appearing um, as a litigant in person. To the, I, I appreciate matters are rather heated between D4 and D5. Um, and D5 does not appear to be joining in on this particular application, but it's something that D4 has effectively started and D6 to D8 are picking up the baton and running with it. Um, therefore, if certain privilege walls need to be put in place, we would not object to that. Right. OK, well, shall I hear Mr. Kapoor? Mr. Kapoor, um, you're, you're, you're understanding this point, presumably. Um, <clears throat> what do you want to say about it? Uh, well, I'm not uh, sure that I'm able to understand it in its entirety, as I'm although representing myself, but I do not uh, enjoy the legal training as my, uh, you know, uh, colleagues do. Uh, so, but I, I mean, I can probably just tell you the way things went so that it's simple, you know, without having to go around in, 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 in find refusion words. Uh, I had engaged uh, with the claimant's lawyers. Uh, much before this uh, suit was filed by the claimant. And at that point of time, the matters which were being discussed were on a much larger scale overall, with, uh, specifically with my reference to the disputes with uh, the defendant number five. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, I had provided a lot of information which was uh, sought, and I think the case in point at that point of time was that we were in a state of flux as far as the claimant uh, number one, which is the company is concerned, sorry, claimant number two, uh, defend number two, the company is concerned that we were not able to move forward in doing any business. We were not able to do anything as far as the company is concerned because the bank was not allowing us to operate the account because it required claimant, uh, which is myself four and five to be signatories to each of the transactions, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, there was pressure from defendants six to eight to find a way to close the transfer in full, uh, transfer the shares, uh, take over uh, the reins of the company and, and, and run with it. Because we had orders from multinationals who were willing to move ahead and uh, giving us the opportunity to run the business and hence be able to honor our liabilities. Uh, you with me so far? Yep. Uh, so essentially, we gave all these details uh, to uh, Kocher and company. So I think the specifics which are being sought by uh, the council for six to eight, the details would be with Kocher and company because obviously I do not have access to my old company emails and anything else at this stage. And uh, no. whatever I could provide the expert was whatever information I could find, you know, with my, in my other emails. And as far as this issue of conflict was concerned, it was raised right at the beginning because obviously as my lawyers, I had disclosed a whole lot of things to them in terms of, uh, you know, the situation of the company or my situation with the defendant number five or 
any other residual matters, including this, you know, new businesses which we can get or get hold of, right? And as far as defendants six to eight are concerned, uh, you know, they would probably uh, concur that I have always tried to enable and help them in terms of closing this transaction where they sold their shares. Now, as far as the specific question on the guarantees is concerned, uh, there was no specific discussion on release of guarantees uh, with uh, with anyone because the whole thing is contingent on first the transfer of the company taking place. And this was very clearly made to, you know, informed to the claimant six to eight that only and only when we can have the company fully transferred, will I be able to go and approach the bank and place before them all the facts that here is the new business, here are the new shareholders, here's how we are going to run the company and hence seek the, uh, what you call their indulgence for uh, the removal of the uh, guarantees. And it was very explicitly explained to them because they were uh, seasoned bankers and businessmen that this can be done only and only with the consent of the bank. It's not for me or anybody else to, you know, uh, withdraw a guarantee because I'm neither the recipient nor yeah, the yeah. giver of that guarantee. Mm -hmm. That is the that is the factual position, sir. Thank you. So do you support the uh, direction which uh, D628 are asking for? Um, well, to be honest, you, uh, there is a whole lot of information which has been shared with my my lawyer earlier, right? And my whole contention has been that if all that uh, you know, is, uh, information is being used now by the same law firm to assist the bank in their claim, that itself is a conflict of interest. But having said that, I would obviously not be uh, like that confidential information which has been there between uh, them as my counsel earlier and myself should be disclosed to any other party because it's not relevant to them. Yeah, so you so you don't you would oppose an order which the D six to eight seek. So you would you would oppose this application by D six to eight for um, a witness statement setting out the advice provided to you. See, because the advice provided to me covered a whole lot of issues. I mean, whole lot of things. Yeah. And I do not know and I cannot trust uh, uh, the, the the lawyer for the claimant to be there for a fair in whatever they disclose and they don't disclose because the very fact that they're uh, de representing the claimant themselves is something which I have, uh, you know, contested and I have, uh, you know, respectfully put forward uh, much earlier at the time of the summary judgment uh, being considered. And that was never decided? Or what was no, it was decided? never decided. In fact, I was very surprised because I thought that was the most fundamental point which should have been looked at and, you know, decided on by the Honorable Court. And uh, in fact, frankly, it is also very surprising that it was never picked up by a defendant six to eight or anybody else uh, for that matter, because maybe it was self-serving that uh, they were not affected by it. And now that when we are talking about certain uh, emails which uh, the expert has picked up, you know, it, it suits them to pick it up at this stage. Yeah, but um, where I mean, are you are you are you renewing your application about conflict of interest? Well, I'm not sure of the procedure, uh, Your Honor. This is my first such uh, endeavor. So, if there I, is I have, an opportunity, I, then I definitely like to, because essentially, you know, you cannot have a situation. I mean, very little knowledge of English law. I might uh, say just simple common sense, Kelly, that if a if a law firm has been representing me getting all kinds of information from me in a wide variety of uh, matters it is thereafter, you know, uh, without taking a no objection from me or without discussing the matter of uh, that thing with me and specifically taking my consent, go and uh, start representing uh, the, the claimant in this case, uh, in a case against myself. Yes. I mean, that's something which I have never seen in any part of the world. Um. We'll come back to that in a moment. But at the moment, if you, if we, if D six to eight want um, the claimant's lawyers to file a witness statement setting out the advice provided to you, forget about the dispute with D five, but provided to you about the of the guarantees, which I think is all they're really asking for. Um, 
Are you content with that or you prefer that you say that is confidential to you and uh, shouldn't be given to D628? No, in fact, on the contrary, if you see the way, uh, you know, the Council for 628 has uh, described the annexure in the uh, thing and Parag Gupta, who is uh, one of the defendants, has actually found some a similar email in his own, uh, you know, uh, what you call, uh, yes, sent emails or wherever that folder it was lying. Uh, that was the only email on the subject. So frankly, if it is only specific to the you know transfer of the company or potentially transferring the company or 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 that matter, that part I have no objection to. But I would not like any other document which was shared confidentially with them uh, should be shared with either defendant six to eight or for that matter, uh, defendant number five. And uh, also, I would humbly request that if the court could guide me as to how we could take take up that issue of conflict of interest uh, on a separate note. OK, so just just to be clear, I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding you. Do you have paragraph 23 of D628? Yes, let me check here. Yeah. Yes, I have the, uh, the, uh, the paragraph in front of me. If you read the first sentence, uh, they seek a direction, and this is what they're asking the court to order. Order that the claimant's legal representatives file a witness statement setting out the advice provided to D4. Now leave out the words concerning his dispute with D5 as well as. Just concern, provided to D4 concerning the release of the guarantees. And exhibiting to that statement copies of file notes, attendance notes, and correspondence relating to the same. If it's just about the release of the guarantees, I think I understood you not to not to object to that. Am I right? Yeah, in fact, I wouldn't because whatever information I saw got from them, I forwarded it to Parag Gupta, and he should have it in his own email. There's nothing more than that. Okay, so on that limited basis, you would not object to that that part of the order. Yeah, I would. Right? And uh, uh, Miss. Um, Ascarian, I think you you were limiting your application to that aspect, weren't you? Correct, Your Honour. Right. Well, I'll ask the claimant what he has to say about it. Do you object to this uh, an order in those terms, uh, Mr. Bar? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, a lot of it was contingent upon what. Uh, D4's position was um, that there was going to be an objection to it on the basis that it was uh, legal advice privilege. Um, if D4 waives privilege in relation to that item, then then that that objection falls away. Um, I, I do have other objections though, and and other points that, that I think I should raise, which are relevant to it. Um, So to the extent that uh, privilege is waived by D4 in relation to the item, then, then I won't raise anything further in relation to that issue, so, save that, um, save to clarify that indeed, it would only relate to the to the issues to which D4 has waived privilege, namely the release of guarantees mm -hmm. and documents related specifically to that. <clears throat> um, the other two items, uh, or the other two uh, uh, procedural objections, as it were, to this is that it's, it's a relatively serious application to produce what, what would have been privileged documentation um, in circumstances where uh, a skeleton was filed at 5 p.m. the business day before this PTR hearing. And no formal application has been made by D6 to D8, contrary mm -hmm. RDC 23.2. Um, and ev even if a formal application was being made, this isn't as against the claimant, it's as against Kosha, and Kosha is not a party to these proceedings. And so no application has been raised specifically against Kosha to produce this documentation. So from a procedural basis, it, it is objected to. Um, my understanding, however, in any event, and perhaps the, the short circuit to this for the benefit of everyone, and I'll just need to, I, I think I've got this confirmed already, but I'm just having a double check. So it is our understanding, and indeed that's 
my understanding from what D4 stated earlier today as well uh, uh, confirms this, is that there is no or was no advice provided by the claimant to legal representative in relation to that issue of the release of guarantees. And as such, there would be no documentation or similar related to that issue. Now, that, that's what I've been told by my instructing solicitors. Um, and similarly, uh, that's what D4 appears to have confirmed as well. So to the extent that that is uh, the final answer, and I'm just waiting to hear back from my instructing solicitors doubly confirming that, that might short circuit at the entire point. And um, to the extent that that isn't the case, so, um, or also we're related to that point, but as I understand it, and this is an issue of confidentiality, so that the 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 alleged conflict of interest goes towards uh, the confidential information in section 12 um, of the DIFC uh, code. And in particular, it relates to not having confident or having confidential information provided by a former client uh, as a consequence of having acted for that client. Um, so this is section 12.13. Of what? Sorry, I, I, I've, it's not in the bundle, uh, Your Honour, um, because it's sort of relatively late notice that this issue arose. If you want, I can pull it up onto the, uh, I can share my screen um, if that assists. Yeah, well, so it's the, it's the Code of Best Legal Professional Practice. Yeah. Would you like me to share my screen, Your Honour? Yes, please. Do we have that up, Your Honour? So I think this is it. it section it says 12, 13, and this is uh, in relation to um, when, a, when a lawyer would, should just decline to represent or withdraw from, from proceedings, and this is the issue that it concerns, so confidential information. The lawyer has acquired confidential information concerning a former client as a consequence of having acted for that client. He must not accept instructions to act against him if a reasonable and fully informed member of the public would think it's likely that such confidential information that would be used. The other client has an ad interest adverse to the interest of the former client, and that information is material in representing the other client in that matter. Now, it's, it's Koshar's position that it never represented, or to the extent that any confidential information was provided to Koshar in relation to the issues mentioned in this email of July 2019, Koshar were not representing D4, but rather were representing the claimant and its interests in relation to the matters discussed within that email. As such, no confidential information was acquired as a result of any engagement between D4 and the claimant. Uh, and in relation to any confidential information which was provided by D4 to the claimant, as, as a consequence of its engagement, and I think this is slightly separate because it relates to D4's um, potentially renewed conflict issue, is that that is not material uh, to this case in any event, as was confirmed previously uh, in relation to uh, D4's application to set aside when this issue first arose. Uh, I, thought, I, thought, I thought this issue wasn't decided then. No, well, it, it wasn't decided at that stage, no, but that was... Kosha had confirmed its position at the time in its witness statement, stating that all of the matters that it was formally instructed by D4 upon were not matters which are uh, relevant to the uh, issues in dispute in this case. And that was confirmed in a witness statement by Mrs. Khan. But no, but no decision was taken by the judge? Not, not as far as I'm aware, no, no, Your Honour. So you, you, you said it's, it's been dealt with? Sorry, I, I, I meant dealt with by Koshar and Co. In, 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 in relation to their correspondence, not dealt with by the courts, Your Honour. Okay. Um, Do you... Sorry, just, 
just in relation to that, sorry, just in relation to that point and on the, if we go back to the email in question. Yeah. So that's at G38. Yeah. So the uh, I think we've we've already had a, a look at this email and the relevant part of it is about halfway down in relation to the quote section or below the quote section, the third bullet down, it says, oh no, sorry, apologies, at the, at the first, the first paragraph and the two lines before the end, it says, to resolve the current deadlock, VJ has discussed the matter with a legal firm who have suggested the following. It's uh, Koshar's position that this reference is uh, VJ discussing it with the claimant legal firm, Koshar and Company, that it, it was uh, Koshar was acting as or on behalf of the claimant when discussing any of the matters contained within this email, and that uh, supports the uh, or Koshar's position that uh, it was not acting on behalf of D4 in relation to any of the issues mentioned or therein, um, or, or any of the issues which relate to the release of the or certainly in relation to the any any issues related to the release of guarantees. And that no advice was provided um, from a Koshar as an independent legal representative to or in, engaged by D4 in relation to these issues. Um, so uh, at this stage, uh, Your Honour, the uh, Koshar and Company do not consent to any direction as requested by D6 to D8 on those procedural grounds as previously referenced, and also on the basis that uh, no such advice was ever given, um, if I, if it is confirmed <clears> to me uh, or uh, later that, today. That, that's, uh, a point, that, that's a point, it's not a ground of objection. It's simply you say none. Well, yes, you're on it. Uh, okay, um, well, in, 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 the, in the context that any advice, any, well, so the objection rather would be in relation to any advice which was given in relation to this issue, it was not given. Uh, in circumstances where it would create any conflict of issues. Well, uh, yeah, conflict yeah. Of Hold on a second. Paragraph 23 is only incidental to the conflict of interest point. It's simply seeking the, the advice given by your lawyers, to put it briefly, your lawyers to the fourth defendant concerning the release of the guarantees. Now, if, he, if, if, your, if your lawyers uh, may have given advice, but not as independent legal representatives, then it wouldn't be privileged anyway. They'd be giving it on behalf of the bank. In which case, what's the objection? My understanding, Your Honour, is that, the, the, well... The answer would be, your answer may be that there are no documents. And I can yes. understand that. Or, uh, and they gave no advice, I can understand that. But what's the objection to them having to say it? One second, Your Honour. I'm just uh, just confirming with my interest and solicitors. My understanding, Your Honour, is that the the documents that were already um, 
well, that, that were provided from the from um, Kosher and Co uh, to D4 in relation to these proceedings are, are already contained within uh, Mr Kapoor's witness statement of uh, March 2022 and the exhibits to that. Uh, as I understand, I'm instructed that there are no further documents. Yeah, well, that may be, well be the case, and there may be a very short um, witness statement, therefore. But is there any, that's, that's not an objection to uh, to the order being made, is it? Uh, and let's, yeah. let's, let's cut to the chase. I mean, either, either there's nothing to give. Or yes, in which case, Aaron, I've just, I've, sorry, Aaron, I've just had to confirm my uh, instructing solicitors are happy to provide a witness statement confirming the same. OK, so what I'll do, um, I assume no one else wants to contribute to this discussion. I should check with the uh, second and fifth defenders. Mr Cheyenne, is it? Not there. Yes, Your Lordship. Yes. Was there anything you wanted? I don't think this affects you, but was there no. anything you, wanted? you don't want to add, add anything? No, Fine. What I'll do is I'll make a, make an order to this effect uh, that the um, my, if you can make a note of this that the uh, order the claimant's legal representative to file a witness statement setting out the advice provided to D4 concerning the release of the guarantees and exhibiting to that statement copies of any file notes, comma, attendance notes and correspondence relating to the same. <coughs> and that's that's all I would order on that. Um, I think having heard the discussion about uh, conflict of interest, I'm not in a position to resolve that today. I think what um, what we need to do, um, Mr. Kapoor, if you want to renew the application you made apparently back in 2020, was it? Yes, please, sir. Um, if you want to renew that or have it decided, um, you must make a separate application. Uh, setting out in full the grounds on which you rely. You may already have set them out, but I haven't seen them. Um, but you, if they've been set out, then you can refer to previous documents or whatever you want to do. But it must be done in a way that gives the other parties an opportunity to respond to it and have a have a considered hearing on just, just on that point alone. But you may decide you, you don't want to do it, but if you do want to do it, that's the way to do it. And I'm sure the, the the registry will help you with the, uh, the the form you need to fill in in order to make an application. But everything everything needs to be set out. The the facts you rely upon, the documents you rely upon, and the prejudice that you say it might cause you, and so on. Do you understand? I understand, sir. Yes. And the same applies to any other party who wants to raise a question about conflict of interest uh, in in this manner. Very well, thank you. <clears throat> that deals, I think, then with the um, additional directions. Is there any any other additional directions? Yes, um, Ms. Asgarian. Um, Your Honour, say for one matter, um, there wasn't a deadline for the witness statement to be filed and served. Um, I, I don't know whether my learned friend has had instructions from his instructing solicitor okay. as to when that could be provided. Seven days, all right. Seven days. Be poss possible, Mr. Burrow? Yes, Your Honor, I'm just double checking now. Yes, Your Honor, that's fine, seven days. I'm very cool. So, Maitha, if you add within seven days. Thank you. Right. Um, so, that's all That's all the additional directions. I think the, the remainder of the things are fairly, root, fairly straightforward, aren't they? Should we do the amendment to the case memorandum first? This is the amendments which have been adv advanced by, um, and now I can't remember which party. 
Your Lordship, with your due permission, uh, our counsel, Mr. P. V. Shaheen, has uh, joined in. And there is one more uh, additional direction that we would like to seek on behalf of D25. Right, what is that? I would let our counsel, Mr. P. V. Shaheen. Yes. Mr. Shaheen. Is that Mr. Shaheen? Yes, your lordship. You have an good morning. Welcome. Um, do you have an additional direction, I think, that you want to ask for. That's regarding the location of D4, your lordship. Yes. Because there's not only case pending between D5 and D4. There are several other issues also. And there are arrest warrants issued by the competent courts in UAE against D4. There are travel ban. There are other orders also issued. Now, since uh, D4 is appearing before a competent court in UAE, it's only fair that he submits a confirmation about his location. Uh, why, why does this court have any uh, concern with that? It's not the honorable court. It's only fair on the part of D4, since he's evading arrest and absconding from the system. To be okay. honest, before he is pleading before this honorable court, in all fairness, he has already declared that he is appearing before the court from New Delhi. We are only requesting for a signed witness statement in this regard. Just a confirmation of what his counsel has pleaded before the Honorable Court. I, I don't see I, ha I have any role to play in that. That's a matter for any authorities that are interested. Should we request D4 whether he has any objection in submitting that or not? We request him outside this hearing, but it's not... <laughs> Is not to do with me. Yes, Your Honor. Respect. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, Mr. Burrell, um, should we deal with the case memorandum or what do you suggest? Uh, yes, Your Honor. The, in relation to the case memorandum, as far as the claimant's concerned, <clears throat> um, there's, there's no objection to the uh, fifth defendant, the second and fifth defendants' updates to the same. I, th I think that the six to eight defendants did at one stage raise an objection. I'm not sure if that objection is still maintained. Ms. Asgarian? You just did. Um, Your Honour, it was only the objection was owing to the short um, notice upon which the documents had been had been circulated. To a large extent, these documents will be overtaken by the party's skeleton arguments and therefore um, there is no objection from D6 to D8. Uh, and is that the same in your case, um, Mr. Kapoor? Uh, we have submitted our uh, modified uh, inclusions uh, in that statement and sent it back to the council for the claimant. So. Well, I think we'll proceed on the basis that the uh, the case memorandum, as variously amended, will will be accepted as the case memorandum in the part in the in the in the case. As it will be overtaken to a certain extent by skeleton arguments before the trial. But uh, if I can ask you, Mr. Um, Burrell, if you can be responsible for preparing uh, the, the final version from, from the amended version, just to tidy it up and lodge it. Uh, yes, Your, Your Honour, so, so to clarify, I mean, I, I can accept, uh, in, certainly in the, in the next uh, few days, I can... Um, I can confirm I'll undertake to accept the, the changes and tidy it up. But it, to the extent that it's further updated, uh, I'm, I won't be the uh, trial advocate um, for the final hearing. Um, so uh, Kosha Ranko can take over responsibility for updating it thereafter if, if that is necessary. Okay, but if we can update it as it is at the moment uh, and lodge it as the agreed, agreed trial memorandum, case memorandum. Of course. Thank you. Um, try, we've got two other matters. There's the, uh, the, there's the protocol and transcripts and so on, which the six to eight defendants have raised. I've read through it. it I don't know whether anyone has any objections to it. Sorry, Ron, just in relation to the uh, case memorandum, I think on a related point, there was also the list of issues. Um, this is a, a slightly different point that arises from this. 
Um, I think that, that D2 and D5's amendments to the list of issues are, are, are not really disputed or there's no, no significant issue from the claimant. D4 has added new items to the list of issues and this, these, these amendments were only received today, I think about 40 minutes before the hearing commenced. Uh, as such, we, we've not had opportunity to go through them and to see whether they accord with D4's pleaded case. Um, and to the extent that they uh, are not contained within D4's pleaded case, then, then there would be an objection. So I, I think um, just in relation to that issue, perhaps the parties can uh, uh, liaise to agree that list of issues within the next seven days or 14 days or similar, um, because we've not had an opportunity to go through that in detail yet. So then instead of accepting the changes, we'll just say that parties to attempt to reach agreement within seven days on the uh, case memorandum and the various amendments to it as drafted and the amendments to it and to 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 submit it to lodge sorry to file an agreed case memorandum if possible with the registry that's within seven days. Uh, in the event that they're unable to um, they can make submissions in writing there's no point having a hearing to resolve this they can make submissions in writing and the court, court will decide on any disputed matters. Right. Yes, thank you, Your Honour. So I didn't ask you, Mr. Um, Shaheen. You're happy with that? Or muted? Yes, Your Lordship. Yeah. And, and Mr. Kapoor, you're happy with that, I presume? Yes, Your Honour. Yeah, thank you. you. Very well. Um, the admin issues, protocol, transcripts, and so on. Uh, I've seen the uh, the documents submitted by the six to eight defendants. Does anyone have any objection to those? Just in relation to the protocol, Your Honour, um, perhaps. Um, uh, it's just my own personal experience of the DIFC courts, but in my, in my experience, it's not common to agree a protocol for virtual hearings in, in the courts. That's something much more common in uh, arbitrations. I may be, that may just be my own personal experience, and, and Your Honour, if you've, if you've got a different preference for how these things are addressed, then then uh, I'm happy to agree the same. Um, but usually there isn't any hard and fast protocol agreed in, in my own personal experience in relation to the same. Th there are a couple of items that um, I, I think will need to be briefly addressed. Uh, I, I don't know um, uh, about the, the timings for the hearing, but at the moment, the timings are currently set down to start at 10 uh, a.m. Yeah. I was going to raise, raise a question about timings um, because we, we move in the UK to summertime which is only three hours different. I was going to suggest that we start, uh, subject to parties being happy with this, start at 12 uh, Gulf time, which would be nine UK time. Is everyone, is everyone happy with that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and everything, in other words, shifting everything forward by an hour. Yes, it's fine. Yes, you know, that, that's fine um, uh, for the claimant. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, item 11, although I suppose this, this may be more relevant because in this case there are multiple defendants. And my, again, in my experience, usually all the lead counsel will keep their cameras on. Um, but to the extent that um, uh, this may create too many screens, as it were, um, because if, if we only want um, the judge, uh, the, the speaking advocates and the uh, and the witness, and then that, that might be um, uh, more preferable. Uh, otherwise, I think the main other issues uh, in, in relation to item 13, um, the, there's very specific prescription about how to make an objection. Again, this is a, only from my own personal experience is that often you can sit there for several, several, you know, uh, 30 seconds or a minute with a raised hand and the, the, the questioning no, moved on by that stage. No, they... I agree. I, agree. Um, I, I think I would regard this protocol and it's sometimes done, sometimes not. I'd regard it as as guidance rather than rather than uh, strict uh, uh, compliance with the letter of it. Uh, but it, this this should be a way of uh, encouraging people to 
proceed in this way rather than uh, rather than be a rule. Is everyone happy with the approach on that basis? And if if um, points arise where we have to depart from it, so be it. Thank you, Honor. Yes, very well understood. Um, the the only other item then I think relates to the uh, transcription. Um, yes. Uh, the claimant that it is is, uh, is is more than happy with DIFC courts uh, recording and transcription and doesn't see the need for any live transcription um, uh, and sees it as an unnecessary additional cost. Um, again, again, it's the, the usual course in DIFC courts is to have just its own transcription service, which can provide a transcript at the end of the hearing. Um, it's unnecessary to have live notes and, and daily transcripts. Whilst it can be, you know, useful at times, um, it's the claimant's position that that uh, they don't think that's necessary for this case, and uh, yeah, then they wouldn't agree to a private. What do, other parties think? What, do, what do other parties think? Mr. Sheehan, you're muted. What's your position, Mr. Sheehan? Yes, we agree with that suggestion. What? Which one? Okay. Mr. Yes, I agree too. Yeah. yeah. Well, you seem to be in a minority, Ms. Ascarian. Um, are you happy to go along with the AFC court transcription? The only um, request I would make in those circumstances, then, Your Honour, is that if a particular party wishes to have live notes or the use of daily transcripts, that obviously they would bear the costs, they would be the only ones who would have the service. But in that event, that um, I would just ask for permission from the court that they may proceed on that on that basis. Anyone got any objection to that? Uh, it it does create a slight slight inequality, Your Honour. So I, I, the uh, claim would object to that. Yes. It's your choice of inequality there. <laughs> um, well, choice of inequality, uh, but without uh, having regard to the costs in, imposed. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, it's yeah, your honour's discretion. Um, uh, uh, the claimant's position. Is that, that the, the, alternative is, the alternative is that we uh, allow um, private transcripts, uh, that the costs in the first instance be borne by D628. But they can be regarded as costs in the course to be disposed of at the final hearing. To be one one second, Your Honour. I'm just receiving instructions. Mr. Sheehan, what do you say about that? No objection. Uh, no. And on that basis, they, they on that basis they would share them, share the transcripts. D two and D five have no objection. Mr. Kapoor, any objection to that? No objection, sir. Yeah. Right. Yes, you're on a no objection from the claimant either. Very well. I'll, I'll give permission then for the D628 to um, to arrange for uh, transcripts. Daily, daily, daily transcripts, is that? Daily transcripts on the basis that they will pay in the first instance for the cost of that. Um, such costs to be uh, dealt with as between the parties as part, part of any relevant costs order at the end of the hearing. And the transcripts to be shared, uh, made available to all parties during the course of the hearing. So it didn't come out very coherently that, but I think you all know what I mean, and I'm sure Maita will put it into better form. Thank you. Right. So we fixed the time and we've dealt with transcripts. Um, what else is the trial timetable, or is there anything else in the protocol that anyone wants to raise? I'm just having a quick look through, Your Honour. I think I think that that's those are the only issues that. Um, that, that I wanted to raise. I think I can I can give an indication that if any people should regard this as the the default position, uh, it, it, but they they ha, they will, will, uh, I'm happy for parties to agree any particular arrangements about particular witnesses. There's always difficulties of witnesses. They're they're in Wi-Fi system. They're in internet 
and so on. So uh, parties can be sensible and and and, and agree what, what arrangements they like about the giving of evidence. But it's very important that the witness is not prompted during the course of his evidence, in either, either verbally, orally, or or by gesture. So that's the main thing to ensure. And and, and it's important that everyone is aware of what is happening in the witness room. Yeah. OK. Anything else on the protocol? Right, next, um, trial timetable. The six D, D6 to 8 uh, have suggested it be um, done on the basis of an anticipated five day hearing rather than four. I think. And um, does it, does anyone have any? Yeah, I mean, yeah. the, time, the time table will be open to amendment as we go along, I and mean, witnesses will go short or, or, or take longer. But uh, as a guide, it seems to me sensible. Yes, well, you're right. The, the claimant filed a, uh, a trial time draft timetable, which is within the bundle at page I 40. Um, the only the only major difference between the two, as I understand it, is that it wasn't clear whether D4 was giving oral evidence, but I think that that is going to take place. So inclusion will be uh, there will be a need to include that just before uh, D5's witness evidence, but in the same structure. Um, the claimant would suggest that the, the claimant's general structure of uh, trial timetable is, is preferable to that adopted by uh, the respondent. The reason being is that it, it's slightly more flexible and uh, has effectively the same or a, a very similar provision in relation to each of the witnesses. And so it's, it sort of lends itself to a more flexible conceptual framework than the uh, D6 to D8 timetable, which has a very specific and prescriptive timings in relation to exactly how long evidence is going to take. Uh, I also note, and whilst this may, uh, as, as I'm not the trial advocate, I'm, I'm unable to, to provide um, uh, authoritative um, points on this, so there may be some accuracy to this, but a D6 to d eight timetable does appear to be slightly one-sided, as in respect of almost every witness, D6 to d eight is provided by either one and a half or twice as long a period for cross-examination as all the other parties and it's only and its own witnesses are only set down for a maximum of 1.5 hours of evidence whereas all the other witnesses are either two or two and a half hours so that there is some disparity in, in relation to the timings and it, it may be that that's that ends up being correct and accurate um may i suggest, I, I, may, so may, may I suggest the, the the party's legal representatives uh, communicate with each other just to sort of fi finalize the trial timetable on a working draft within uh, seven up to seven, no no later than seven days before the trial starts. I'm grateful, Your Honour. And um, any any dispute can be resolved on the first morning of the trial. I think the in initial stage on both sides is openings by parties. Rather than, rather than witnesses, and that, so we can resolve any un, uh, unresolved matter uh, 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 on the first day as part of the housekeeping and residual matters. Yep. Um, the <clears throat> I, I agree, by the way, that we should have a break in mid mid morning of ten fifteen minutes that sort of thing. The time, precise timing of the break will depend upon the stage the witness is at. And it, there's no point interrupting a witness who's just about to finish. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll work through that. Take an hour, an hour, an hour's break in the mid-session, UK lunchtime. Also, to about, about 12 o'clock UK time, um, which would be three o'clock golf time. Uh, but apart from that, and the, the fact, apart from that, and the fact that the trial timetable should be brought forward by an hour each day, then, then I'm content with that. 
All right, is there anything else that needs to be dealt with then at this stage? One minor point, so it was raised by uh, D6 to D8, but um, uh, just in relation to whether uh, the, the court requires or the judge will require any hard copy. And um, again, in my understanding is that usually it's all dealt with on, on the case line. So, uh, but, but I know that um, there can be specific references. No, I, I'm happy to deal with it on case lines, provided that it is well indexed. Uh, case lines works perfectly when it's well indexed, but not if you have to keep on going to other files. So it's really get, getting the uh, core bundle uh, and everything on, on the same page of the of this uh, the same file. OK, but don't, don't send me mountains of paper. Thank you. Right, is there anything else anyone wants to raise? Oh, can I ask something? Sorry, it occurred to me, I was told at one stage that the second defendant no longer existed, but yet, um, yet Mr. Shaheen appears as the second and fifth defendants. Mr. Yes, Shaheen. The license, fuck off. the license is not renewed up to date, but we can renew it. You, you intend to renew it? And yes. So the D2 will be a live party? Yes, Your Honor. I see, thank you. Right. So if there's nothing else, then no one want to raise anything else? Just in, just in relation to costs, Your Honor. I, I don't know if, it, if it's just the usual order of costs in the case. Well, I, I thought costs in the case. Yep. Is that? Yes, Your Honor. Sheen. You're muted again. Yes, you should cost your trip. It's fine. Mr. Kapoor, you're happy with this cost in the case. Thank you. Very well, that concludes the hearing. Um, Maito, if you want to send me uh, the order, if you're uncertain about anything, um, I'll be available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.